then at the turn of the century, as we have life becoming very industrialized and people are moving from the countryside to towns and cities, we've got epidemics of rickets experienced by 80% of the children in Europe and um, the white plague of tuberculosis, which was kind of like how cancer is now, but back then with tuberculosis, and it wiped out hundreds and thousands of people. Um, and then, at that same time, in 1903, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Danish physician Niels Feinzen for curing tuberculosis with the sun, with heliotherapy. And following in his footsteps was medical doctor, Dr. Auguste Rollier, who was the most famous heliotherapist at, at his time. And in a 1923, um, Time magazine article, they wrote that he brought sun therapy to its highest perfection. And um, at his peak, he operated 36 clinics in the Swiss Alps, which I have these amazing pictures of. And at these clinics, he would treat um, many diseases, including rickets, tuberculosis, lupus, smallpox, and the disinfection and healing of wounds. And his miraculous complete cures at the time made headlines around the world because he was totally curing tuberculosis. This is ancient uh, Greece. It's actually a modern painting, but a depiction of um, ancient Greek, Greek people sun gazing. This is the clinic. One of them. Isn't that amazing? Imagine that being a hospital today. <laughs> I mean, what a great way to heal. <laughs> Break down the walls. Great service. <laughs> He's actually better. He was just like, I'm loving this. <laughs> Getting coffee in bed in, in, the, ra in the sun. Um, the man in the middle, that's Dr. Rollier. You can see he has a tan, of course, actually all the doctors do. And I actually, I want to find out more information, but I have, there's other pictures and the, the, they're always doing things, so I think they actually kind of put them to work. There was one where there's like all these women in rows, like about 20 women, it kind of looks like a school, but they're outside and they're all typing and stuff and they're just in these like underwear. Oops. Oh, hold on, that was fast. So in the, in the winter, they could spend the whole day outside. And again, they're healing from these devastating diseases. This is after a year, and this young girl had tuberculosis. It's, it's just amazing. And this young boy had tuberculosis. And um, it come, like you get these sort of gaping wounds you can see in the first picture, and this is after a year, and all, everything's totally cleared up. So you can see that uh, perhaps there is such a thing as a healthy tan. So at his clinic, he was doing this great healing. You know, well, really the sun was, but um, he also, Dr. Rollier said that the sun is the best masseur. And he found, just as the ancient Greeks did, that the sun, the stimulating sun, playing against naked skin in the fresh air, induced muscle tone in the muscles without movement. That's my kind of workout. <laughs> so there's an action of the sun that was able to fortify the muscles and create a proper body heat, proper maintenance of bones, and a proper posture that the sun created. And that's what the, the original Olympic athletes were also discovering. Um, and he also was expressing that women are so careful to put their pot plants outside, why not their children? <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. He also found that the best results were obtained w in the summer by sunning in the morning and um, eating nutritious meals. And he said that well-nourished skin responds better to sunlight than mineral-deficient skin. So he just did wholesome, wholesome meals and sunlight. He didn't calculate calories. He wasn't looking at micrograms of calcium. It's simply wholesome meals and sunlight. I mean, does it get any easier than that? But unfortunately, diseases of darkness still exist. 
children still deprived of sunlight, some still get rickets, and many people experience things like osteoporosis, arthritis, hip fractures, and dowager's humps. And in the northern latitudes, by late winter, when our vitamin D reserves are very much depleted, there is an increased diagnosis of influenza, dental cavities, and cancer diagnosis. So don't go to the dentist in March, <laughs> or the doctor, because <laughs> you could get something that you could take care of by the end of the summer. So this is, again, an ad from, um, you know, a health, health anti-cancer something. I can't remember what it's from. Some sun education program. Creating concern about the sun, most dermatologists and beauty magazines wax weary about ultraviolet hazards, and health campaigns like this one advocate for the avoidance of the sun. The sun has become the perpetrator of photoaging, wrinkles, and hyperpigmentation, along with three types of skin cancer. There is the serious and ever-increasing malignant melanoma. There's squam, um, malignant melanoma, which is, just to explain it, it is uh, cancer of the pigment cells, and it can infiltrate the lymph system, spread aggressively, and unfortunately, it can be fatal. Squamous cell carcinoma and basal cell carcinoma are non-melanomas, and basal cell carcinoma is the most common and least dangerous because it doesn't have a tendency to spread. And while it is true that our skin can be vulnerable to the sun, and repeated sunburns in the same area can create visible damage, there, but uh, despite all the negative press that links the sun to skin cancer, there really is a lack of evidence that supports that. And what studies show is that those that are vulnerable to malignant melanoma are not those with the greatest cumulative solar exposure. And that other studies show that those that um, are likely to get melanoma are those that work inside, and that uh, adults and children that work and play outside are less likely to get melanoma, and that those that live closer to the equator are less likely to get melanoma. And that melanoma, the skin lesions, they normally develop on areas of the skin that are not normally exposed to sunlight. In a 1986 Australian study, it showed that there's no correlation between sun, the sun and melanoma, and that actually melanoma incidence was reduced by 25 to 40 percent with increased recreational sun exposure. In his book, The Sun and the Epidemic of Melanoma, Myth on Myth, Dr. Ackerman, who was um, a founding father in the field of dermatopathology, basically a big shot in that world. <laughs> he substantiated that there's no proof whatsoever that the sun is related to melanoma. There's also a 1982 study by Dr. Helen Shaw that was published in the medical journal The Lancet, and it showed that indoor workers that are exposed to artificial fluorescent lighting and have minimal sun exposure are twice as likely to get to develop melanoma than those that work outdoors. And this is back in 1982 when, when we weren't, you know, most of the workforce was not staring at the glare of a computer screen all day. So it really is lack of sunlight and our culture's lack of vitamin D3 that seems to be overwhelmingly linked to cancer. And that other studies are showing that appropriate sun exposure actually prevents skin cancer. And that incidences of melanoma increase with, um, sorry, decrease with sun exposure and what increases it is sunscreen.